Well, before there was Kraft macaroni and cheese, it was just James Kraft. He and his brothers had moved down from a dairy farm in Canada to the suburbs of Chicago. And they used to make cheddar cheese, and so when they came to Chicago, they got in the business of distributing cheddar cheese. So what James would do is he'd go up to the cheese distributor, and he'd buy a huge wheel of cheese. He'd load it onto his cart, take his horse by the reins, and he'd walk over, take his horse down to the cheese purveyors and say, hey, Mr. Michelson, would you like a quarter wheel? How about a half wheel today? And that's what he did. He distributed cheese. And it was a good business, but he noticed something very interesting, or actually very apparent. In the summer, people stopped buying cheese. Now, it wasn't that people didn't like cheese, but the shopkeepers, if they bought too much cheese and people didn't buy it, it would go bad. So they just stopped stocking up on cheese. And that's when Kraft realized that he could take over the cheese market if he could figure out a cheese that didn't go bad. Now, at the time, people knew why cheese went bad. It went bad because of the bacteria. And they also knew one way to stop that is just to heat up the cheese, to pasteurize it, right? But the problem is, is when you heat up cheddar cheese, it turns into a, a, a gooey mess. The fats and the solids, they separate, and you're just left with yeah, just a mess. And what Kraft realized was if he wanted to take over the market in the summer for cheese, he had to solve the key problem of how to pasteurize cheese without ruining it. I call these problems keystone problems. These are the problems that separate nascent technology from the market leaders. It's the one high impact problem that if you can solve, you know you're going to be ahead of everybody else. And so Kraft, he went about trying to solve it. After he was delivering his cheese, he'd come home and he'd put, put out a pot on his stove and he'd adjust the heat a little higher, a little lower, different times, and trying to figure out a way to get this cheese to heat up and not turn into a gooey mess. And so one day he was just stirring his pot and he was thinking, you know, maybe, maybe I could put it in an ice bath as after I heat it. Or maybe I could add some powder to it. Maybe that would help it stay together. And he stirred just a little bit too long. When he looked into the pot, it was a creamy cheese. Kraft had just found that by stirring for a long time under moderate heat, he could actually get those solids and fats to rejoin and he would create a beautiful cheese product. He created the first preserved cheese. He sold them in eight ounce tins. And they were very popular because this was right around World War I. And the military bought tons of this, literally. But the problem is, tons of this. The military bought tons of this. But think about it. Is this really an innovation? Tinned cheese? I mean, think about it. When was the last time you said to your friend, hey, let's go out and get a can of tinned cheese? Never, right? But I bet almost everybody in this room has had Kraft's tinned cheese. You just don't recognize it because it wasn't until the 60s that Kraft invented a process to slice it and cover it in cellophane wrappers. That's right. Kraft's tinned cheese is American cheese. And it's what adorns probably most of the cheeseburgers in the world. All of this from realizing that the key problem, the keystone problem, was in figuring out how to pasteurize cheese. Let's look back at the recording industry. It wasn't a lot different. When the cassette came in, the keystone problem was noise quality. Dolby B fixed that. The problem with the cassette was it was still analog and it broke a lot. The CD was able to solve that with digital signal processing and some cheap laser technology. The problem was we wanted more and more music to carry around with us. Well, the compact hard drive, one that was only an inch square, solved that keystone problem. What separates nascent technologies from being market leaders is often keystone problems. And these are the problems that you need to focus on and solve. A lot of people ask, well, how do I know what the next technology is going to be? If you go back and talk to your teams, you'll find out they already know a lot of competing technologies for your current products and services. 
they just dismiss them or ignore them because there's some problem that separates them. What they should be thinking about is what is the key problem that would enable this nascent technology to be better than my technology, to obsolete my technology. If you focus on those keystone problems that can enable some nascent technology that today doesn't seem that great, to obsolete your own product, that will lead you to a great innovation.